Okay, so, so we, we convene this session, uh, Representations and Investigative Modeling, uh, where the presenters originally was uh, Atli Magnus Selov, Katarina Gabrielsson, Ulrika Karlsson, Lars Marcus and Pablo Miranda Caranza. Katarina Gabrielsson unfortunately got ill uh, during the day and had to go home. It's a bit of a pity because there was a particular role in this setup that, that uh, her presentation would cover. Uh, but I'll deal with that. <laughs> uh, I'll briefly go through what she was going to talk about and also explain uh, what that role was. Uh, but before letting the first speaker on, I will, I will give a bit of a framing to this session, which intentionally I have not given to the speakers because they have been tasked with presenting specifically uh, projects and reflections in relation to, to, to investigative modeling, materiality and, and uh, representation and so on. So I don't want to distort that with my uh, framing. Uh, we'll get to talk about that afterwards also. Uh, it's not like a very different framing than what Little I've provided, so it's not a surprise, but I'll still briefly go through it. So. Uh, representations uh, and models in a way, uh, I will say now that one of the important reasons why we should be talking, need to talk about it more even than maybe we do is because to a, uh, to a certain extent we can say that they, they are not just representing ideas but they are also uh, modes of relating to the world, to memory, to projection, to imagination and to materiality that sets how we understand not only the world but our place in it and in relation to one another. And it uh, enables and restricts how we can actually act and, and, and react in the world. Uh, thereby, so um, such things as, as Linnaeus, this is the very first bubble diagram that we know of, for instance, Linnaeus' uh, uh, diagram of, of, of uh, biological subdivision uh, is an invention that allows us to relate to organization of the world in a completely different way and, and just reframes how we consider uh, what we can do and what nature is and biology and everything. It's, it's a representation that just rearranges how, uh, how we understand it and thereby in the end can lead to the idea of families and relations and the way we, we, we operate it in it today as compared to before. This is a, not a full representative history of representation because we're just skipping here to the, the work of in the 90s and 80s and so on within the architecture where they really went into sort of representation as representation as such as, as what architecture was dealing with. This is the chamber works by Daniel Liebeskind, where the idea is that I can do this, it doesn't have to mean anything because audience will make it mean something, which is also part of what, what, this is, what representations are doing in models. They generate understanding whether we want it to or not uh, in whatever forms they come. So not only are mo models and uh, representations modes of relation to the world, it also means that they, are modes, uh, they, they generate modes of subjectivity that enables actions and imaginations, but which also conditions, imposes and trains dispositions. And, and uh, they actively transform how we understand and relate to, the, to architecture and the world. Uh, that is... Uh, for instance, in a discussion like the famous discussion by Colomino on the medialization of architecture and architecture's exteriority and, 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 and the predominance of vision, uh, or, or for instance, we can extrapolate that to the representation such as perspectives that not only um, emphasize vision, but emphasize vision as a static activity by one person standing at one place. And it's also timeless, not in the sense of timeless forever, that it actually doesn't have time. Uh, and it also focuses on uh, an egocentric understanding of architecture and the world, where it is about where you are and how you see and what you see in one location at one particular moment in time. And that transforms and, and of course, conditions how we think that we should relate to, make use of and make architecture. Whereas, for instance, flow diagrams emphasize movements, flows, and, and, and for instance, in, we, in, in diagrams like flight densities, uh, you could argue that they also 
emphasize diagrams of economic and political power and they de-emphasize individualized, individualized perception and, and action and makes us just part of a system of, of things that should work in a machinery that in the end creates this overall thing. It doesn't necessarily... Uh, uh, but they are also then a means of, of, of guiding and, and uh, also enable understanding of collective patterns and actions and how individual uh, actions add up to something that we commonly relate to as patterns or, or something like that. Uh, and in this sense, models and diagrams uh, and, and uh, representations uh, enable us to, to uh, address the world both creatively and critically, and the models and representations become catalysts and enablers, as well as limitations to what we think we can do and what we think we can understand, and thereby what we, in the end, produce as understanding and knowledge and, and spaces of action. In this sense, uh, Katarina's presentation, which I'll briefly go through later, becomes important in a discussion of representation, because she was going to talk about alteration as non-representational practices. And of course, in a discussion of representation, we have to include a discussion of non-representational practices to make the picture actually work. Otherwise, we, we sort of cut off the point of talking about representations to a certain extent. So, uh, but again, uh, the panel has been asked to present and reflect on specific work uh, and, and, and specific uh, research, both findings and approaches and, and thinking, and begin towards a wider discussion, which we will have in the end when all of the panel uh, is, is done. Um, a discussion that in this framework uh, that I present now uh, is equally important in its specificities as it is in its generalities. We can't really talk about what I tried to frame now without actually talking about the different specificities of different media, different representations, different modeling and so on. And in investigative modeling arguably therefore stands for exploring these modes, uh, restrictions, uh, discoveries and challenging... Oh, oh it stands for... Sorry, it stands for exploring these modes, uh, refining, discovering, challenging and inventing, uh, both strengthening and destabilizing the way we understand architecture and the world in the extension, uh, which is uh, the path that they sort of offer uh, towards uh, uh, continuously changing and increasing knowledge. And it's in this framework I would like to, to, to sort of have this uh, discussion. Uh, but as I said, I think it really needs to be held in, 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 in relation to the specificities of, of, of uh, models of representations, be they representations of flows or of, of just notions or how we understand the world or for that matter ma ways of just generating forms and, and creations. So with that framing, I would like to welcome Atli up to the stage. Yes, um, thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, and um, thank you for inviting me here. I'm going to talk about one specific um, project that deals with the Stockholm exhibition of 1930 and the use of models in its attempt to reconstruct some of the architecture of, of this exhibition. I will try to keep my presentation short. I will only say a few words, first about the exhibition itself, then second about the reconstruction project, and then third, and maybe most importantly, a few words about models as a specific form of, one might say, making architectural knowledge. Um, to begin with, the Stockholm Exhibition 1930 of Arts and Crafts and Home Industries, as well as the, as well as the so-called Acceptera Manifesto that was published the following year, are of special significance for Swedish architecture. They essentially mark the breakthrough of modernism here in Sweden and you might say also in the other Nordic countries. The exhibition is organized by the Swedish Arts and Crafts Society managed by the art historian Gregor Paulsson, the director of the society, and designed to a large extent by Gunnar Asplund. You're probably all familiar with this, so I'll just really try to keep it short. 
Um, Gregor Paulson conceived the exhibition as a very comprehensive and decisively progressive program exhibition with three distinct themes. First one, architecture and construction details. Second, streets, gardens, and transport. And third, household objects. So it was, in a way, much more comprehensive than previous exhibitions. And Gunnar Asplund designed an exhibition that was not to be a monumental show. He wrote against this, he wrote against designing one monumental building, but rather that was aimed at what he called beauty and festivity. So in the end, the exhibition consisted of, ne of nearly a hundred large and small temporary pavilions that were scattered around a large area around the Bay Dürgortsbrunswiken. And that formed, as you might say, a symbiosis with the location and the natural environment. And added to this was a number of um, kiosks, restaurants, as well as flags, advertising, and so on and so forth, that lent the whole exhibition more the uh, image of a summer festival, much less um, a typical architectural exhibition. So the whole thing was meant to celebrate a new modern spirit and a new modern lifestyle. In the end, the exhibition was a huge success and was seen by more than 4 million visitors, including 25,000 people from abroad. And at that time, it was the most popular Swedish uh, exhibition up to then. Um, <clears throat> despite this enormous success, the architecture of the Stockholm exhibition has been studied surprisingly little in detail. And this may mainly be due to the fact that all the pavilions were torn down in within six months. And on the site, you can now see the neoclassical maritime history museum designed by Ragnar Oestberg. So in order to reconstruct this exhibition, and in order to rediscover the architectural qualities, um, master students at the Schalmers Department of Architecture, as now called Architecture and Civil Engineering, um, worked in 2014 and 2015 on the reconstruction of the most important pavilions. And in this context, it is interesting to note that the exhibition itself, or the architecture of the exhibition itself, is surprisingly poorly documented. The drawings and documents of the buildings by Gunnar Asplund and his colleagues are widely scattered, and only a few schematic drawings were published. So we had to resort to a variety of sources um, to do this. And um, as a result, or maybe one of the most, um, or the richest source were numerous photos that were taken by, well, both professional photographers as well as simply visitors. And the reconstruction required a special methodology using models at, it, at its core. As I said, as hardly any primary sources were available, we used secondary sources, photographs, the few drawings, as well as descriptions, and we compared and combined the information um, to gain sort of sufficiently accurate data. And we used, amongst other things, digital tools, image processing software, drawing software, for instance, to de-skew images and to produce first a digital model and then a physical model. And we used the methodology of what conservationists call an abstract partial reconstruction. In some aspects, even an, even an anestylosis, that is an archaeological reconstruction. And we built only what can be verified or at least deduced from sources. And what is unknown, we simply left blank. Um, so um, there are actually parts of the models that are really blank. And there you can see, OK, we know nothing about this part of the models. We also made some basic assumptions, for instance, that Asplund and his colleagues reused details of recurring building elements as the whole exhibition was planned and built in a very short amount of time. Um, the result of this whole enterprise is that models provide a much more and much better access to the architecture of the exhibition than drawings or written texts do. 
as the model builder is forced sort of step by step to understand and to recreate the building, the design concept, the structure, the, spa the spatial system, as well as the proportions of the building. And the reconstruction of the pavilions led to a number of discoveries about the quality of the architecture of Gunnar Asplund and his colleagues that cannot be seen in pictures or drawings, but um, are, or that can be seen in uh, the models. And it was also published in a book uh, that came out last year. But this brings me finally to um, the role that models sort of play in this whole thing. Um, <clears throat> Because the duality of construction and media is a central feature of architecture, and the knowledge of this duality is as, is as old as, as the discipline um, itself. And among the media involved, in addition to the drawing, the model is of special, is of special significance. Um, <clears throat> Models, both abstract and concrete, are characterized by three properties, as we learned in this process, and that give them a special significance. Namely, first, representation. They sort of represent something. Second, simplification. They also simplify what they show. And third, they are, in a way, non-unique in sort of uh, being assigned to the object of their representation. And this is particularly evident in the architectural model because it essentially shares two properties with architecture, namely three-dimensionality as well as materiality, and it can therefore be considered its, well, substitute in a way. Furthermore, it also has the ability of making this anticipatory function visible not only in abstract, but also directly at a glance. You can really understand by looking at a model how this building works. So in short, models contain and transmit a specific form of knowledge that cannot be replaced by any other medium. And in this case, it is interesting to note that among the uh, studies on media in architecture, the models the model has been given the least consideration up to now. I only want to show sort of three examples from the long history of models in architecture that demonstrate this versatility. For models were used as a um, artifact and teaching resource. Those models brought back by architects from their grand tour to Italy from the late 17th century onwards. They were also used as presentation tools, as some masters of modern architecture used to sort of present their projects. But they were also used as a research medium. And this, in a way, comes back to why models with their three properties are so important in this process of um, understanding and designing architecture. And on this note, I think it is important to distinguish between models and prototypes or models and miniatures or sets or representatives or symbols. Because as I said, models do really have this unique capability. And I think that in particular, when you think about all the, all the digital media available today and this process of substituting models with prototypes and other things, I think it is important to note that the physical model in particular, in all its forms, has the unique advantage. And this was already pointed out in the 16th century, so it's not a new thought, that all forms of, of abstraction are bound to material. That's the sort of unique um, thing about models. And I think when you look at the Stockholm exhibition models that you can really see this at work, how this sort of abstraction is really um, repre represented in um, the exhibition architecture <coughs> models. Thank you very much. How am I doing time? One minute to one. <laughs> Shall I sit down? So uh, I'm not going to pretend that to hold uh, the talk Katarina would have held because I'm not definitely Katarina. I don't know the subject so well, but I'll just briefly introduce the, the, the 
work on alteration that was made in this Nordic Journal of Architecture by Katrina Gabrielsson and, and Tim Anstey as editors, uh, which was a, a call and a challenge to architecture and architectural disciplines and other disciplines to to address the fact that architecture, uh, both as a disciplinary profession and as a material object and process, is is uh, also is is not static and is continuously under alterations throughout. And then uh, the focus of her talk would have been on what she called uh, the represent non-representational practices of housework, which is not just home or or domestic work, but working with houses and buildings which uh, she argues is something we all do, not only architects, but everyone uh, through the process of, of living, or at least that's how I understand it and, and, and uh, her talk. And also to, to sort of in this series of ways of, as I framed it, relate to the world and architecture and materiality, it becomes an important component together with all the other component in this. That's why I want to give this very, very brief summary of my reading of her contribution. Uh, and, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's see here. Um, so um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, yesterday uh, we had a panel session in the afternoon, also on representation, and I had the opportunity to talk about um, aspects of uh, imagery that the okay sorry <laughs> that architectural imagery is everywhere at the moment it's um, um, calling for our attention and influencing our behavior as well as political decision making there is some kind of promise about this soon to be built realism that is all over uh, all over us and i was also pointing out that there is a growing uh, renewed interest in the disciplinary architectural use of drawings and architectural representations. So this was my talk yesterday. Today I'll be a little bit more concrete. Okay, so I will show two projects that have been developed and produced with the support of the SRE Architecture in the Making. Vector Interference 2 and Aquatrope are two projects by Architectural Design and Research Collaborative Servo Stockholm uh, with myself as a principal and Servo Los Angeles with Marceline Gao as a principal. Uh, a few years ago, we wrote an article uh, for the ACSA where both of these projects, Aquatrope and Vector Interference, were presented. Uh, the text was called Architecture in the Penumbra. Penumbra, the partially shaded outer region of the shadow cast by an opaque object. We were interest in, interested in how vagueness can be construed and considered productive. Uh, we looked at, we were interested in two qualities of the penumbra. Methodologically speaking, being in the penumbra, this semi-shaded region, during a design process, just before naming something, or decisions are made, just before decisions are made. A speculative and generative moment, just before something falls into form. And a more literal version of the penumbra, when the penumbra produces ambiguity, and perceptually blurs the legibility of form. The shift from one medium to another inherent to the practice of architecture, from the drawing to the model, or from drawing to building, involves varying, varying degrees of specificity. The exclusion of certain kinds of information and the inclusion of other kinds of information within a given medium is driven by the conventions of architectural notation where a degree of generalization is often required in the interest of enhancing legibility. In these two projects, geometry here, in the form of a drawing, is underspecified in relation to its material manifestations. Any act of transmutation of, or moving from, one geometry, from geometry to object may thus be corrupted or eschewed. It keeps us, that is, in the gray. Um, Vector Interference 2, 2013, is a proposal for a 500 square meter multi-purpose building at the KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, up by Lindstedsvägen 22-30, or 22-30, in Stockholm, that incorporates a biotic roofscape in conjunction with flexible lecture ga gathering and exhibition facilities. 
The aim of the project is to enable the built environment of the institute, not only house research and education, but also to allow the research and educational program to affect the built environment of the campus. The cavities and niches of the vector interference provide a rough surface for the adherence of a low maintenance biotic roofscape. The vector, the simple vector techniques, now let's see, I, the simple vector techniques were used for the design in terms of massing and subdivision to generate architectural specificities as well as to inform the logics of machinic processes of fabrication. Uh, an underspecified drawing in the form of um, uh, a series of parallel non-dimensional uh, vectors or curves was the point of departure for the design process. Vector interference was produced when gaining negative thickness through CNC machining subtractive processes, resulting in a series of intersecting cavities. Pure black, but also Vanta black, produces a loss of distinction of figure that which is perceived and on an everyday basis informally said to be black or blackened, such as here, where the wood is charred, is not absolute black, but often a dirty, uneven black with varying degrees of light absorption, such as blackish gray, blackish blue, blackish red, or blackish brown. The smaller intersecting cavities and the charred surface disturbs the legibility of the geometry. The project embraces corruptions and entropic instances that produce an eroding effect on the figure of architecture. Aquatrope explored the possibilities to develop a roofscape of large scale volumetric tiles that can channel water in different ways to provide for different moist regions for organic matter to thrive. The project was exhibited at SciArc 2013 in Los Angeles. An archipelago of gray ceramic tiles situated on the gallery floor was illuminated by a series of orbicular glass light fixtures. A cable sargassum um, confounds the simple diagram of a closed electrical circuit with the entropic tendencies of accumulation, excess, and disorder and in doing so, creates a third spatial level layer, a drawing manifested in space, a canopy suspended above an unnatural gray ceramic landscape. That image will come later, so you, you, you will see it soon. <laughs> Coming back to the underspecified drawing <clears throat> in relation to its material manifestation, mathematical information of the geometry was translated to a CNC machine form in foam Plaster molds were casted on the positive foam work. Later, glass was blown into the plaster molds. This process of translation or transportation of mathematical information into glass entails both exclu exclusion of certain kinds of information and inclusion of other kinds of information within a given medium, where the legibility of the figure of geometry is blurred and produces an ambiguous aesthetic between material and digital. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will also continue a bit on the discussion we had yesterday, which was quite uh, exciting, uh, about the disciplinary knowledge developing within uh, architecture to a great degree and in many different ways. And how, and I will try to extend that to how this may now also be very uh, important and uh, benefiting also for other disciplines, not least I think in the social sciences. Given the fact that we are pres uh, presently seeing an absolutely unprecedented urbanization, global urbanization. We are not only rebuilding Sweden currently, we are also rebuilding the planet. So the act of building, of architecture and so forth, spatial structures and constructions are taking place everywhere. <clears throat> and you've seen all these different numbers on how you can calculate this. This is just one possibility or one, uh, one way of doing it. 
but then you may wonder uh, and ask yourself, how do we make sense of these urbanizations? How are cities conceived in different disciplines? And I think that often we can become, as architects and urban designers and so forth, rather surprised. I mean, in economics, one still analyzes the idea of land rent according to simple geometrics of this kind. Of course, there are also more advanced methods, but basically a lot goes back to these kind of uh, ge geometries of, of cities. Cities being a center periphery uh, phenomena with concentric circles get as far, yeah, yeah, you get it. Uh, and of course, if we think, think now that how we act upon the world is dependent on what knowledge we have on the world, and what knowledge we have on the world is dependent on how we represent the world, this is the answers you get. And similarly, I think we can see that also in, in different uh, hu human geography or soci sociology, uh, how we rep represent cities uh, spatially, geometrically, uh, where, for instance, when we talk about social segregation, uh, this is how cities are represented at different uh, city districts, and then we make uh, some kind of uh, uh, differential uh, calculation on the different groups within that uh, area, and then we have a solution. Either it's segregated or it's not segregated. And of course, this influences how we talk about this, as we all know about the problematic areas in all kinds of ways, but it also formulates policy, right? To how to deal with this. So if we have a problematic area, the problem should be solved in the problematic area and so forth. I think here is one area, which is a huge area, where representations and models about spatial constructions and such as cities can play a, a very vital role of changing these ideas and informing and uh, even improving research in several of the social sciences. Uh, <clears throat> because I think a lot of the models used are based in geography. And I will be uh, make a tremendous uh, simplification here about what geography is. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and I will draw here uh, from our eminent uh, speaker, uh, Daniel Koch, who often talks about the difference between distribution in space and distributions of space. And geography, to a great deal, concerns the distributions in space. It can be anything distributed in space also buildings or cities or whatever. But in architecture, we're very concerned about the distribution of space. That is how space is actually structured and made accessible for humans. That's the whole deal with architecture. And then the whole thing changes. And I think this is one um, way into this uh, uh, discussion. One more thing is that any kind of model of, uh, that we make about cities and for so forth, have some kind of idea about a relation between humans and the environment. And often this has this typical dichotomy between the subject, the human, and the environment, the object. But I think often when we work in architecture, we think about this differently, not always, but often. Uh, and I think we can find support and make it more distinct the way uh, we think about space in these terms. For instance, by different theories in psychology for whom these issues are, of course, very central. And I think a lot of you have heard about the theories of affordances. It's often used within uh, industrial design and, and such things. Uh, but I think it's a, uh, if you start to read uh, the person behind these theories, James Gibson, it opens a very exciting uh, universe of thinking about space and uh, not least the relation between humans and environment. Affordances, of course, to be specific to begin with, is, ab is about not the physical object, it's not about humans, it's about what emerges in the meeting between the, the two. The meeting between the physical properties of the physical object and the, the abilities of a human acting. So this would be very, as James Gibson talks about it, this would be a very different meeting if we, it was not a human, the same door, but not a human, but a dog. The dog's abilities are very different, right? So the affordances would be completely different than they are if there's a human. I think this is exciting. 
uh, and I'll try to <laughs> expand on it. Uh, it is a clear dis uh, uh, um, um, shift from more regular physicist conceptions about space as an isotropic thing with the, that can be described by XYZ um, um, axis. And of course, physicist space is perfect and wonderful to use if we want to make precise description about space. Anything can be located using these kind of descriptions. We use it when we make drawings and so forth. Fine. But we don't live in it. We live in something else which Gibson calls ecological space, not in an ecology meaning, but it's the it's an environment. For instance, if I stand here, it's a difference between I cannot go move through the floor. There's a ground level that is very important for us as people. It's the beginning of the ecological space. And of course, there's something behind that wall that is not very far away, measured in meters, but it's impossible for me to access without making a rather awkward promenade over there. So it's a far away distance. And it's this structured and shaped space that we do, that we manage through architecture, that is the ecological space of Gibson. So I think here is a lot of theory that's very useful in architecture and, and, and urban design. <coughs> And this is theory going back to the 70s, so he has some lovely 70s uh, drawings and so forth. And he ma uh, makes this to illustrate a new ontology or an ontology in, in relation to this idea, where he talks about the world that's made up of three things, media, solids, and surfaces. Media is where we as humans or other animals can move, such as air and water. So he doesn't talk so much about space as he talks about air, which is kind of interesting and opens a lot of uh, interesting my, uh, ideas. But there, this medium is structured by different solids, so we cannot move wherever we want and so forth. And importantly, in the interface between the medium and the solid, we have surfaces. And these are extremely important in informing us where we are, how we move, and orient ourselves in that. Not least, since he also emphasizes that <coughs> perception is not something you do as in cognitive science, it's something that you look upon you know, uh, as flash um, snapshots shown to you and then you're supposed to react on that. When we uh, perceive things in the environment, we typically move. Our eyes moves, our heads moves, and our bodies move. So we are fantastic at reading things in all kinds of directions. And, um, sorry, okay. So anyway, um, uh, coming to the point, uh, we movement is very important for perception and our cognition, uh, cognition of space. And coming then over to our type of uh, uh, research, very much based in space syntax theories and different developments of that, we, have rep we work with represent representations we call axial maps, and there are all kinds of developments of that, but going back to the basic representation. And starting to think of what do these actually represent? I think with the help of Gibson, we can become very distinct on that, saying, well, uh, uh, because an axial map is the least amount of straight lines to cover all accessible space within an area that you want to analyze. What do they represent? No, it's not a representation of space. It's not a representation of human behavior. It's a representation exactly about affordances, what emerges of a human in space. And in this case, both physical accessibility and uh, cognitive uh, visibility and per per perceptuality. And this is what captured, and that makes it very exciting to think about what it is that we have in the axial map. It looks like a very oh, rather mon mundane, rather uninteresting kind of representation of straight lines, but actually it's a representation of these affordances. That means that humans are written into these um, uh, representations as much as the physical environment. And that's maybe why we find these e extraordinary effects that when we make some calculations about this, uh, how they work together, uh, they, <coughs> they, um, uh, uh, and how they are related to other, how they, uh, in a system point of view, kind of are the centrality or what is more close to something else and so forth. Even though that is done from simple geometry, there is no other data than the pure geometry of it, 
What emerges here is not just a built form of Söderman. We do start to see the distribution of urban life on, in Söderman. But there's no data on that. It's pure geometry. That's quite extraordinary. Because I do think that most of you recognize that the red ones where it's more accessible and more central in the system are the places where you move more often than others and the green and blue are where we move less. And an extension of that, we also find, um, re for instance, the retail distributions. An extension of that, we also find um, uh, rents, a cost, uh, land costs and such, such things. And suddenly we are right into the, the um, social sciences. So I skip that and show that I know this now it's a zero. But just one more, just to say that, so if we are able to start to build really large models of this kind, I think this would be extraordinarily, extraordinarily exciting to talk with economists on, urban economists, or urban sociology. And of course this is something we already started and do. And get a much more profound representation of the object that we're interested in, or what economists and sociologists also are in interested in, and suddenly it changes also the knowledge about these objects, and in extension also the 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 what we can uh, the policy we can apply, and this is something we now built in a large international laboratory of the comparative models of the cities of Stockholm, Gothenburg, Eskilstuna, and Amsterdam and London, and it's done in all comparable ways. So it will be finished in the beginning of next year, and then we can start to make large-scale analysis of this. And this has been done through very generous grants down at Chalmers, so we're very excited about that. And we have also, together with KTH and researchers there, developed a software called PST, which you can use and download free uh, to do these kind of analysis. Thank you. So here, also with continuing the discussions we had just today <laughs> uh, on representation, um, I'm going to show a few, um, I'll just uh, introduce a little bit myself with this, because this is where I always, as many of you know, show code <laughs> in presentations, because it's a little bit my kind of subject of research, uh, code as a, a form of architectural representation. And uh, lately I've been sort of um, trying to put this uh, within the framework of um, uh, philosopher Nelson Goodman's uh, definition of annotations. Um, Nelson Goodman defined in detail the relation between art forms, including architecture, and notation. According to Goodman, arts can be divided in two major categories. Arts like painting, uh, that cannot comply to forms of notation, he defined as autographic and those like music that uh, make use of notation or can make use of notation, he defined as allographic. Architecture, according to Goodman, is a transitional case between allographic and autographic. Drawings and designs identify work of architecture and also instruct its reproducibility into a building. This places architecture within the allographic domain. At the same time, there is seldom more than one instance of a design that is a building and in this sense, architecture is autographic. Goodman described rigorously why some types of architectural draw drawings, such as plants, qualify as notations and scores. These encoded the instructions for the production of a building in a way comparable to how mus a music score encodes and identifies a music performance. Goodman's characterization of some architectural drawings as notations allows to establish a comparison between drawings and programs. Programs, however, are often closer to music scores or the script of a theater play than to a traditional drawing, as they script performances to be carried out by a computing agent, a person or, or a computer, rather than the spatial organizations and forms of a building to be interpreted and reproduced as buildings. Um, some of these differences between drawings and programs coincide also with the two categories that, according to Italian Hellenist Carlo Diano, uh, have dominated Western civilization since the Greeks. Form and event. Form or eidos, etymologically a seen thing, 
is characterized by vision, figure, space, permanence, and generality. Event, instead, is identified with temporality, sequence, and number. Oops. Ooh. That's uh, too used to use a Mac. So uh, let's see. There. Um, and this is a little bit illustration of what we were discussing yesterday. Um, uh, does digital forms, which are always the result of programs, you know, even if you use an ordinary or regular CAD, um, you know, program or software to draw something, you're actually using a program, uh, are rather the result of an accumulation of events. Uh, these are covered, uh, these events are covered in the case of the CAD software as the only purpose of these events is to maintain a, con a continuity with the drawn conventions of architecture. But programs as a type of architectural notation make possible, among other things, to represent and treat uh, as architecture forms that are the result of accumulations of events. Erosions, accumulations, vortices, or dispers dispersions become the object of architecture. Form becomes instead formation, and you know, I shows quite a few examples of that yesterday. Oh, I did it again. So, so there. Um, but looking beyond form, the event can also become an object of architecture through programming. Computations need to materialize, to be translated from switching operations performed by transistors inscribing programs into phenomena that can be perceived as images on a screen or as printouts, as sound, uh, or as the actions of uh, CNC machines and robots. Catherine Hales has characterized the, this need of materialization with the image of an Oreo cookie, in which embodied materialities as input and output sandwich a digital middle. Thus, programming becomes a notation system that can orchestrate the performances of these events, mediating between the materialities of these inputs and outputs. The example presented here, uh, the one-bit browser, um, is an experiment in trying to understand the transformations of the most basic informational entity in the computer, a bit, an on or off, one, zero, true, false, digital datum uh, into an event. This was a conscious reductive approach to study, to study digital events, uh, an implementation almost literal of Antoine Picon's analysis of the computer in architecture according to which computer are systems of programmed events in which a single bit of information is nothing but, but an elementary event on top of which more complex occurrences are built. The process of design and iterative development of this one-bit browser showed the complexities of such a translation. This translation can be very straightforward. You know, we can translate a bit on an on and off thing through a simple light bulb, uh, you know, like a little pilot light, like you know, like I see one here in front of me in the computer. Um, but the one bit browser, it sort of tries to display this, these two states uh, through a physical shift in position of an object. So this is a little bit the, the sort of complex mechanism uh, to do something, oops, did it again, to do something very stupid, uh, which is actually to have a little thing, a little object or a polyhedron that can move from this position to that position through sort of standing up or open to a closed position to indicate this on or off or true or false. So this is uh, the object uh, of that this, this uh, one bit browser when it's closed. And this is while it's opening. Fortunately, it couldn't show films, it's a movie, so it's a little bit more interesting to see the actual event, not just uh, photographs of it. And this is how it looks like when it's open. And um, this is a little bit what the actual browser shows. Um, in principle, it could show any type of information, uh, anything, for example, taken from the internet, and that's what it's doing now. That's why it's called a, a browser. Um, 
But in the example shown here, the, this, uh, single, um, the single bit of the prototype dis displays weather data reduced to the binary value of clear or overcast sky. The coordinate selected in this case to, to, to show the, the sort of the, the weather correspond to a remote island of Noir or Isla Noir in Tierra del Fuego. The displays of the cloud cover at Isla Noir illustrates the intricacy of a meaning stacked on even the simplest of data. Other than deserted, inhospitable, windy and rainy, it's also prominent in many accounts of voyages about, around Cape Horn and the closest landmarks to the latitude and longitude given for the island of W from the eponymous book W or the Memory of Childhood by George uh, Perec. In order to collect the information it displays, that is the amount of clouds uh, on uh, Isla Noir, the program queries an online weather service for the latitude and longitude, longitude corresponding to the island. However, the weather data returned has as its source not the island itself, but the closest weather station available at the town of Punta Arenas, about 200 kilometers away. Thus, despite the number of associations of this object, romantic remote, remoteness and desolation, geographical or, lit, geographical or literary, the actual object represented by the bit of the one-bit browser remains elusive. Despite the exactitude of the digital transa transaction, the meaning of the object denoted by the position of the prototype remains subject to the knowledge and choice of an interpreting observer. It may be the sky in the imaginary island of W over the actual island of Noir or in Punta Arenas. Um, this is a semiotic uh, observation that uh, links to the discussion of the panel yesterday about architectural representations. Uh, and which can refer to the iconic, symbolic, and indexical characteristics of, of science, according to, to uh, Sanders Peirce. I'll show you just a little last example. This is uh, a project that uh, I think that Jonas also showed a project from this, uh, from this research project, um, and that is what's called Sensing Energy. And this is a very, this has been done a few times before, but it basically it's a uh, a little uh, or a mirror that would sort of uh, follow the sun and uh, and uh, make that you know sort of arrest the movement of the sun and sort of concentrate it in one place so it's always lit it. and you could sort of control you know in the, this kind of dark street in uh, winter in Stockholm. Okay, just finishing, just conclusion. Um, and this is a little bit of the the sort of the, the um, algorithm or uh, the calculation that uh, that is sort of uh, um, makes this possible, and this is uh, a picture of the um, prototype. Uh, and thus, thus, the actualization of of programs as events brings to the foreground dimensions that have perhaps been subdued by the speciality of the drawing, not only to the interests in uh, environments and events of vanguard the vanguardist architecture of the 60s from Archigram to Archisum, but even to the fountains of Le Notre and those of uh, Villa d'Este. Uh, one should not forget that hydraulics uh, constituted the high tech of at, at the time of that, that uh, Villa d'Este, for example, was uh, constructed. Uh, or even the water clocks and sundials of uh, Book 8 of Vitruvius. Could all speakers? Oh, could all speakers uh, come forward and using these mics? Um, we we are a bit since earlier also a bit behind in the schedule, so we'll try to to have a short discussion at least. But we have the time to have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, but I would like to start the discussion if possible. I know you've just been presenting, so I'm not necessarily requiring you to, but if uh, any of you would like to reflect a bit on anybody else's or all the others' presentation. No? I'll, I'll share out the mics so you, so, so you can do it. 
There are two more. And I hope uh, they are on. Uh, one for the audience, yes. Sorry. I can just uh, maybe start because I was uh, both three of us were in the discussion yesterday, so it's. Uh, but I was very interested by what you showed about the the model, and I was uh, thinking a lot, um, reflecting also about. Um, you know, at least about what I was doing, because I, I don't really talk so much about what's the the method, or you know, it's, it's all the time. I, I deal with representation on what I'm doing, but not so much uh, on the whole how it affects the whole method or uh, working with things. And that I thought was very interesting to to reflect. And well, um, I was or in regards to um, architectural models I found it while working on this project was that um, classical architectural models or the properties of architectural models this kind of simplification representation and non and non unique assignment capability apply to both theoretical <coughs> models as well as to concrete architect or real architectural models and in that sense, models are c somewhere in between a method and a theory, really. And I feel that uh, many people working with digital tools today are not really aware of what category of um, information they are working with. Um, one of the promises of digital tools really is, is that you can use the same set of data to produce both a digital model as well as a physical model that you can sort of by CNC milling or 3D printing literally translate data into an object. But the question for me at least, and that's maybe something for you guys to answer, is what is this kind of prototype? Is it really a model or um, something else? And that I think is a very um, interesting question in regards to sort of classic architectural models. I, uh, I th uh, my comment would be um, that I think we can sense here that there is uh, very powerful disciplinary knowledge that is developing in this field of representations, models, prototyping and so forth that could, that is um, um, not least a result in recent years development of, um, in that. Uh, myself, uh, I feel a little bit too, li too not enough uh, sophisticated in that debate. I realize I could go much deeper into that uh, and would need to do that. So mm -hmm. we yesterday had a very, also a very good discussion about uh, models and what is the difference and, and the need to be more precise about what we mean by representation. Mm -hmm. So I agree with your question, we need to develop this. But my point here would be that because it's a disciplinary thing, I think this is something also that where we have an opportunity to bring something to other fields. Uh, and it's not necessarily, it's we're not the only ones working with models and representations, mm -hmm. but at least we are conscious about it and we're pretty good at it. And this is something we could develop uh, uh, much more. Yeah. Okay. So shall I say so? Oh, okay, so, no, but I don't know if I have comment on this or not really, but. Myself, I'm very fascinated about the relationship between uh, notations, instructions, this um, language uh, that has developed within architecture field, and the relationship to uh, materialization. So, uh, and how sometimes they actually uh, almost conflate. So, when is a, well, I showed, for example, like it's not even a design, it's just a series of parallel lines. Uh, is only an instruction or a couple of notations that are given to some kind of technology that processes it and it becomes um, some kind, something that is um, designed through a machinic process. So the, I, I don't know, I think it's very interesting this disciplinary research uh, uh, between representation, notation, instruction and its materialization. 
And, uh, and I'm also very fascinated perhaps about some of the art or some of the architectural practices of the um, 60s and 70s. That were also the conceptual art when, when there was an interest in, in uh, writing, for example, instructions for uh, producing a piece of work. But another thing today that I thought was fast, the most fascinating thing I heard today uh, it was uh, you used um, you used uh, a kind of archaeological way of or no no was it no or re restor kind of restoration terminology that I never heard before. It was an anastylosis, you mean, or no? It was something with partial abstract reconstruction. Yes, partial abstract reconstruction. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, that's a term used by um, conservation or people in, in heritage studies to denominate what kind of reconstruction you're really doing. I mean, there are different approaches on how to reconstruct a building or how to um, preserve or reconstruct or um, redo a building. And there are sort of different modes of, of reconstruction that, that have been established basically since the Renaissance. Um, so um, there are sort of different modes of um, constructing or reconstructing something. It, does it have to do okay. when there is not enough knowledge? Like when you, yes. when you, ne you need yeah. to fill in. Yes. Like Piranesi fills yeah. in yeah. The, 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 yeah. The, uh, when, he tries, when he tries to reconstruct yeah. the map of Rome. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I think <laughs> since we are a bit short on time and, and I, I should say that uh, there will be a break very shortly and, and it's important to, to try that we try and start again at 16.30. I would like to conclude with hearing if there is one question from the audience that we could pose to the, to the uh, panel. There's one up there. Wait for the mic, please. Because it's being recorded. Yes. Gosh. Hi. Um, I was um, I was wondering if one of you could um, define the difference between the model and the prototype. What would you say that the difference between those two is? Thank you. I can, I can try. <laughs> uh, I think that um, a model is a representation of something that uh, exists uh, outside the model, uh, even if it's uh, maybe a concept or it does, can't be can be very vague. Where is it that it exists? But it's a something. It's a and I would think that the prototype is something that it's, uh, it tries out something. It just, uh, I, I, at least in my own sort of practice, that the, that's the way I would sort of define both things. But I guess that sometimes they blur, of course, because, I don't know, I guess that you can prototype a model also, <laughs> or model a prototype, I don't really know. <laughs> um, I think I can add to that. Um, I mean, one of the basic ideas of a model is the non-uniqueness of it. A um, model can represent something, but the relationship between the model and what it represents is not a unique one. While the prototype, or that's at least in my understanding of digital tools or producing a prototype, is that it is a, a rather direct product of a certain set of data. Okay, thank you. And we have to conclude there so we can have a full break before we re reconvene at 16.30, that is in 25 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>